Hi guys, it's Dr. Danny Shaban with Dominion Women's Health and welcome to our podcast. Today we're freezing in the studio because the studio decided not to turn on the heat. Just busting on them a little bit. Or I'm not supposed to use that word. <laughs> but So today's podcast is going to be a little bit off topic. We're just going to wing it. I'm lucky enough to have Sophia, one of our nurses, who started with Dominion Women's Health how long ago? Three, four months ago. Three, four months ago. She's a Virginia Tech grad. So, Best school on earth. And she's planning on going to grad school, so she has a time limit with us. So we're going to just talk about whatever pops up today. And you, we're going to start off with some questions or tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a Virginia Tech grad. I'm from Winchester, Virginia. I want to go into obstetrics and gynecology, so that's why I work in an OBGYN's office. Um, I want to go to PA school eventually. Don't know when. Um, I don't know what else you want. Um, well, the funny part is, is she doesn't talk about it, but when she interviewed for our practice, I said, so when do you want to go to PA school? And she said, well, I'm looking at that. And I said, you got one year. You got one year to apply or you're fired. Because what we tend to do with a lot of the graduates that come out of college and that want to go into nurse practitioner, PA, or even med school that scribe is I don't want you to get caught in the trap of working and not wanting to pursue your career. So we send, tend to put a time limit on for them, mm -hmm. even though she is one of the best nurses. That's a lie. He's she's recording it. Or oh, shit, it is being recorded. <laughs> can you curse? <laughs> yeah, it's my podcast. I can do whatever the hell I want I with it. <laughs> so you, we're gonna start off with some questions for me. Yes, um, I've texted multiple group chats of friends to ask uh, what sexual questions or questions about their vaginas that they have. Um, a question that all my friends ask me all the time is birth control. All of my friends want to know what birth control they should be taking, what's the best birth control, what birth control is going to make them fat and have pimples, and that's always their biggest question for me, is like, what birth control do I recommend? I think that's a great question, and I love how it's the one topic that I probably know the most on for my career. In residency, my research was contraception, and we dealt with low-dose hormone therapy. So the big things that you want to talk about, especially if you're going to become a PA, a nurse practitioner, a physician, and talk to patients about hormones, is talk about the different types. Hormones have been around forever. And if you look at what they used to do back in the 30s, the 40s, it's sort of scary. But when we start off, I usually start off with the easiest and work my way up. So I talk to patients about birth control pills. And back in the 1960s, birth control did have major side effects. So when patients talk about, oh, I don't want to get fat, I don't want a blood clot. Well, back then, estrogen progesterone combinations were 100 micrograms of estrogen. So it would even make an elephant gain weight. But then in the 80s, the FDA what's, put... What's, what's, you're, saying, you're saying that like it's a big number. What's like... It's a huge number because I'm going to, when we get to the new ones... Like right now, the new birth control has 10 to 20 micrograms of estrogen. Okay. So you're talking about a huge decrease. Yeah. So in the 80s, the FDA said you can't make a pill that strong. You can't even make a pill more than 50 micrograms. And then back in the 80s, you had birth control that was a pill that was a triphasic. And what triphasic was is the guy that designed birth control wanted to mimic his own wife's cycle. So it changes dose three times during the month, just like your normal cycles. Well, with those, you also get a lot of side effects. So if you have PMDD or PMS, or you're having breakthrough bleeding, it's all gonna get worse, whether people believe it or not. So now a lot, a lot of the newer pills that are out are called monophasic, meaning that it stays the same dose for 28 days, which is amazing. So you get less side effects. Also, back in the olden days, patients would get blood clots. You had all these issues. So, like, if you talk to your grandmother, she'll tell you, oh, my God, don't take birth control if you're over 35 because of the side effects. Well, that was based on those studies. Now, with these lower-dose pills, like the 10-microgram and the 20-microgram estradiol pills, 
you can take them as long as you have no contraindications for as long as you want, as long as your provider is willing to see you and work you up. So that was the great thing about the birth control pills. And there's a lot of retrospective studies now with birth control pills showing that if you're on the pill, it decreases your risk of ovarian cancer, fibrocystic breast disease. There's some colon cancer decreased risk factors. So there's a lot of benefits. And some of the progesterones that are in the birth control pills help control acne because it brings down your androgen levels. So I love the pill. It's great. There's got to be a downside to the pill. The downside to the pill is it sucks. You have to remember to take it every single day. Unlike the pills, again, in the 1960s, where you could miss two or three pills and not get pregnant because it was so much freaking hormone in your system, it took a week to get it out. Well, with low dose, it has its bad parts, too, because if you forget to take your pill for a day or two and you have unprotected intercourse, you have a high risk of getting pregnant if you're ovulating during that time. So you have to be careful with it. Um, trying to think of what else that's pretty cool with the pill. Another... Do you... Is it... Okay, so the pill either has one, just estrogen or estrogen and... In general, pills... 90 plus percent of pills have estrogen and progesterone. Okay. Then you have pills that have what's called norethindrone or drospirinone that have just progesterone in them. And those pills are prescribed for people that don't want to take an estrogen base or have a contraindication to take estrogen or have had side effects from estrogen. The old theory, it goes back to based on the studies in the 70, 60s and 70s, is women that are breastfeeding don't want to be on a combination pill. They want to be on a mini pill or progesterone only. But now we've seen just with these lower dose, it doesn't affect your milk production. The one running joke that I tell patients all the time, do you know why your pill pack always has a Sunday start on it? But if you open it up, it has stickers so you can change because mm -hmm. it was designed by a male and I think he was a chauvinist but I shouldn't say that because I really never met the guy that designed the pill but he never wanted his wife to be on her period on the weekend so that's why it's a Sunday start you're lying I'm not joking look it up that's so, why they start on Sundays that's that's the what we were taught when we were in residency that was the whole point and they made it sound like oh women that never wanted to be on their period on the weekend no it's different. Because I'm waiting to pick up my birth control from the pharmacy because I'm like, I keep forgetting every Sunday. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the big thing about You can do any day of the week. That's why if you open up a pack, it's got all those stickers. You can change the dates. Yeah. So the next type of birth control that we talk about is the NuvaRing. The NuvaRing has been around for 20 years. And it's um, drospirinone, uh, I'm sorry, desigestrol and... Um, estradiol. So, and it used to be the lowest dose birth control in the world. And I think it's amazing. It works on body temperature. So you squeeze the ring, it slides into your vagina. You don't feel it. Your partner doesn't feel it. And you have a sustained release of hormone for 35 days. So the cool thing about the Nuva ring is it's like that old inf uh, commercial where you guys don't know, but it's my generation. You set it and forget it. So you just put it in there. You don't have to worry about it. You can take it out anytime you want, rinse it off in the shower or the sink, but as long as it's not out of your vagina for more than four hours, you maintain that hormone protection. What is the other advantage of the NuvaRing over a pill? There's no first pass effect. So the, the whole first pass effect means it doesn't go through your stomach, your stomach to your food, your at stomach acids to your liver, your liver to your bloodstream. With the NuvaRing, it it releases the hormone into your vaginal mucosa, which goes directly into your bloodstream. So patients love it. Um, the compliance rate with the NuvaRing is much higher than a pill. The next thing is the patch. The patch had a huge upsurge in the 90s. Everyone wanted the ortho Evra and all these other patches. But then it got a bad rap because prescribers were prescribing it to patients that weighed 250, 300 pounds and it was affecting the absorption, it was affecting blood clots. So 
I believe the contraindication, it's under 185 or 195 pounds. You can prescribe it, but you can't prescribe it more than that. I've never seen anyone take the patch. Um, you know, it's, I've got probably a handful of patients that do it. Again, some people love it. Some people hate it. I'm not a big fan of it, especially like for you. You go to the beach during the summertime and you got a patch there and it can show the tan line. You can try to hide it, but... So some people love it, some people don't. But I always give them the, the information. The next thing, which I can't stand, and it was part of my research, and we wrote a paper on it. I feel like I know what you're gonna it's say. It's the Depo shot. I hate Depo. Yeah, Depo is the kiss of death. And I don't really <laughs> care who prescribes it and swears by it, but in the 70s and 80s it was a really big thing because you could you gave the woman the shot and it worked for three months so these patients didn't get pregnant for three months they came back in well it's a mega dose of progesterone so if you have a history of anxiety depression made it worse if you had a history of obesity it made it worse and in this one study that was done it showed that if you were on it for a long period of time it caused osteoporosis or your bones to thin but the the good news is, is that for young women, by coming off of it, it's reversible. So I'm not a big fan of it. I hate it. I can't stand it. I only give it to patients that just can't take anything else. So I tend to skim over it really quickly. The next big thing are IUDs. IUDs have been around forever. You have the Paragard, which got over 50 years of history behind it, the, even the ones before that. And it's a copper IUD. The great thing about it is it works immediately when it gets placed and it's reversible immediately. Has no weight issues, no bone density issues, no And you're hormonal. talking about the Paragard. Correct. The next one, the, well, let me finish that one first. So that, that's amazing. It works for up to 10 years. You can take it out anytime you want. It's gotta have a downside. So if I have a patient who has endometriosis, severe pain with their periods, really heavy periods. Well, guess what? It's going to be the same or worse. It's not going to change. Why is it going to be worse? <clears throat> because sometimes your body reacts initially to the Paragard and you have more cramping than normal, but then it settles down, but it's never going to get better painful periods or heavy periods with the Paragard. But if you have normal periods, I love it. I, as you know, in the office, I put a lot of them in. The next one are progesterone IUDs. You're dealing with Kylena, Mirena, Liletta. Those are progesterone-based IUDs. And what's the difference between Kylena, Mirena, Liletta? So they're all the same progesterone. It's just the, uh, the applicator for Mirena and Liletta is different. Um, Kylena is different than Mirena because it's a smaller applicator. I, per, I know a lot of prescribe, people prescribe it and it works. I'm not a big fan of it because it has a higher risk of complication, of perforation, expelling. But a lot of people prescribe it for younger women who've never had a kid, whose cervix is stenotic. It, it tends to be easier for them. But I've never had a problem with Liletta putting it in someone who's 17, 18 years old. Um, with the progesterone IUDs, I usually prescribe personally to my patients that have history of endometriosis, heavy periods, anemia, painful periods. It's not a bad IUD. Um, but is it my first choice IUD? No, if they don't have those issues. But you can use it for other reasons, for birth control as well. But with that being said, it's progesterone only. So I tell patients, just remember there's a potential for ovarian cyst. There's a potential for weight gain. If you have anxiety, depression, you're on antidepressants, it could possibly get worse. And then for your age group, I don't describe it, but there's tubal ligations and there's different forms of tying your tubes. Well, what about Nexplanon? That's a, another one I forgot to talk about. I know. Nexplanon is a progesterone IUD, not an IUD, a progesterone insert. And it goes into the inside of your arm and it's about that big um, and again that's progesterone only um, I tell patients it works it works fairly well the big thing is is remember it can cause irregular bleeding for up to six months until your body gets used to it and you won't have periods once it, the, it levels off 
But just like any type of progesterone hormone, it can cause weight gain, it can cause ovarian cysts. But again, if there's a contraindication for a combination birth control, it's not a bad choice. So now you're just trying to make me talk for more than you. Yeah, no, I am. Remember who the host is <laughs> and who the guest is. I'm just joking. Um, okay, <clears throat> let's say I'm a 22-year-old college student and no history of endometriosis, no like abnormal bleeding, no bleeding between periods, no heavy periods, whatever. I'm just a pretty Happy much go no, lucky girl. no complication patient, but I want birth control. What are you prescribing? What are I mean, you recommending? I mean, I love NuvaRing. I love, and if you don't feel comfortable, usually I tell patients, if you normally wear a tampon, the NuvaRing is easier than a tampon. And it's easier to take out, too. You just put that much of your finger in your vagina, you pull it out, throw it in the trash, and you have your period. I love the NuvaRing. I love low-dose um, birth control pills. But if you want something to set it and forget it and not have to worry about it and not freak out that you went out of town and left your pill pack on the counter. I mean, the Paragard IUD is amazing, but the NuvaRing has a lot of benefits to it that a lot, a lot of providers don't talk about too, is that it can cause vaginal lubrication with the lubrication is called lactobacilli, which helps prevent yeast infections and is a natural lubricant. Um, the other thing I tell patients about the Nuva ring, let's say it's Friday and you're supposed to take your ring out to have your period and you're going to the beach this weekend, leave it in until Sunday when you get back. You don't have to take it out on day 21. As I said before, it works for 35 days. So you have that window of opportunity. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like those two for someone like you because then I don't have to hear, oh, you made me gain weight or I'm all emotional or anything like that. Yeah. You're already emotional enough. I'm, I'm not joking. emotional. That's a lie. <clears throat> um, okay, another question from my friends. Um, what type, when should you be worried about vaginal odor or discharge? Like, what do you see when you take off your panties? What's, like, not supposed to be there? What's, like, abnormal? And that's a great question. I mean, like, when we talk about, like, lactobacilli, lactobacilli is like clearish to very very pale not white but it's very pale and it's a natural lubricant if you're let's say taking your panties off after like work or whatever and there's a yellow stain a brown stain that's not normal okay so if anyone tells you it's normal it's not normal to have those excretions to where they come out um, if you're getting like a thick white discharge, that's not normal. Any type of odor is not normal. Okay. So when I have a young woman and even someone in their forties or fifties, that'll come in. First of all, we want to talk about like, when did this odor start? What leads up to the odor? Cause sometimes it could just be right after your menstrual cycle and it's just your body just cleaning itself. But if it has like a fishy odor, a malodorous odor, I mean, we'll do what's called a wet mount, look under the microscope and see if it's bacterial vaginosis. Um, if this is a recurrent discharge, sometimes we'll culture it just to make sure we're not missing something. It's not a sexually transmitted disease. If it's white and thick and it's itchy, we look under the microscope again to see if we can see rods and see if, if it's yeast infection and treat it. The, in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, douching was really, really popular in the world, especially in the US. Um, I don't mean to be like graphic, but I remember as a kid, my mom taking us to a grocery store and there were aisles of douche, like stuff to, for vaginal douching. And um, now you, you, don't, you can't even find it hardly at all. Because what happens with douches is a woman will douche and it smells amazing, everything's good, but you just destroyed all the good bacteria with the bad bacteria. So the first thing to come back is the bad bacteria. So that's the other thing I talk to patients about. Are you douching? A lot of the times too, I talk to patients, are you taking a lot of baths? Are you putting stuff in the bath? Are you using um, scented soaps to clean? Those are the big things. And then we talk about um, your sexual partner. like. Is your partner using condoms or are you using lubrication? 
because surprisingly there's a lubricant with condoms that destroys the HIV and STDs, but some women can get vaginal infections from it where it destroys some of the normal bacteria in the vagina. Because think about it, if it's that freaking strong to kill that stuff, it's going to be messing with the pH of your vagina. And then we talk about just taking like probiotics and all that. But sometimes it's a little hard to treat discharge until you figure out what it is and then move forward. So some lubes on condoms have like stuff to kill yeah. the bacteria? Well, and that's what it's... If you read like a condom, it says it has Noxol 9 in it or other types of chemicals. Mm -hmm. And that's supposed to destroy HIV and certain STDs. Well, if it's that strong, it's going to affect the pH in your vagina as well. And I'm not trying to say, and I'm going to say it clearly, I'm not saying don't use a freaking condom. That's what you're okay. saying. No, I'm not. Dr. Chavan is anti-condoms. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, and what I tell patients that are that sensitive to condoms is, you can use non-lubricated condoms or sheepskin. That's the other thing to do. Okay. So they have condoms without that stuff? Yes. Are they hard to find? No, they're over the counter. Oh. Yeah, you just ha have to, like, look and see what's in them. And, again, it just depends on, like, if I have someone who is, like, seeing a different person every single week and is doing crazy stuff, we'll deal with the discharge. Crazy yeah. Stuff. Just keep the stuff on the lubricated with Nox all night. I'd, last thing I need is for a condom to break and someone get an infection. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. No. <laughs> question away. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this is another question for my friends. Um, if Are all STDs or STIs, do all of them show symptoms in women? Or do some of them? You know, like back when we were in college and even in high school when you took sexual classes or whatever, they make it sound like you'll know immediately. Surprisingly, and you've probably seen it in our practice, I would probably say 75, 80% of sexually transmitted diseases, you don't even know you have it at the time. And that sort of sucks because we'll get patients that come in and we'll do their pap smear and then you got to call them and say, I'm sorry, your pap smear showed chlamydia or it showed this. And then the person is devastated and then you're having to treat them and their partners. So no, not all. I mean, stuff like, um, gonorrhea and chlamydia, sometimes gonorrhea will cause some symptoms with discharge. It's not like men with gonorrhea where they have painful urination and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot of it's asymptomatic and it's tested when we see you for your annual or you come in complaining of a discharge. The hardest thing for us as a practice is narrowing down for the patient. And we can't do it. When did you get this STD? And because patients will come and say, oh, my God, you diagnosed me with HPV. And I go, it's a virus. It could be lying dormant in your system for months, years. It's. It has nothing potentially to do with the partner that you got now or a year ago, or it's a herpes infection, or so we we go through all those. Especially trichomonas is seen a lot of times on paps. I've never even heard of trick, and so I until I started working at Dominion Women's Health, never. Yep. Yeah, it's very common. Only like chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis, which I feel like nobody. Really. Well, syphilis is not, well, it's on, in some places, it's on an uptick right now, but. It, but you hear about it so <clears throat> much. Yeah, right? because they scare the shit out of you in high school about yeah. syphilis. And I mean. <laughs> they really do. But I mean, I like in, in 20 years plus in our practice, I don't think as far as like true sick patients with syphilis, I think we've had one in 20 plus years that's ever been really sick. Uh, we've had a few like incidental testing, but syphilis isn't as, I mean, you're talking about, I think the most common STD that's worldwide is HPV. I mean, HPV hands down is the most common. And then from HPV, we deal with herpes and gonorrhea and chlamydia. And I, I tell patients all the time, especially in your age group that come in, they're devastated that, they got gonorrhea, chlamydia, and I go, not that you'd ever wish this on anybody, but 
if that's what you got today, that's a lot better than having herpes where it's a virus and you're going to have potential outbreaks the rest of your life. If you got chlamydia and you got treated properly and you're away from the person that gave it to you, you're going to be totally fine. Uh, what's my next question? Um, okay. When I have a bunch of friends ask this to me and like even patients ask this all the time, when I'm coming in for a pap smear, like, what does that even mean? Like, what are you doing? <clears throat> they, they just know that they're coming in for a pap smear and that they should do it when they're 21, but they have no idea what a pap smear is. Well, and I think that's a great question because a lot of times I like to see patients prior to their first pap smear. So a lot of my patients will bring their daughters once they're like menstruating or like 15, 16 years old. And we'll talk about sexual health. We'll talk about like, hey, if, if and when you become sexually active, this is what we need to plan ahead for. Talk about the Gardasil vaccine. But if I have a girl coming for her first pap smear at age 21, and you've seen it with my patients, any a new patient, I come in the room, they're clothed. I mean, they're not already undressed and ready for an exam. So we sit and we talk. We talk about their past medical history, their present history. And then I'll step out of the room, have them change and come back in. And we listen to their heart and lungs, do a breast exam, make sure they're developed appropriately. We look for signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome, hair growth and abnormal spots and stuff like that. And then what we do is we take an instrument called a speculum and we talk, th we talk it through with the patient and we place it vaginally, and we get a visualization of the cervix. We look at the cervix, make sure that it's appropriate uh, as far as the color of it, if there's any lesions or anything. And then we take a, either a brush, a spatula, and we take a swab of the cervix. If the patient wants to be tested for sexually transmitted disease, we'll also put a Q-tip back there and test the endocervix as well as the vaginal vault for um, sexually transmitted diseases. Then after that, which is probably the most important thing, is we do a pelvic exam on a patient. We make sure that their uterus is normal size. Excuse me, they don't have like ovarian cysts or masses in their belly. And then after that, we go ahead and also talk a little bit more about birth control if they want it, their menstrual health and all that. And then as long as everything's going well and we don't prescribe a birth control, I'll say, okay, as long as everything's going well and you don't need anything, I'll see you in one year. For me as a practice and what I found in our studying um, birth control and writing all these papers on birth control is when I start someone on birth control, I always bring them back within three months. And the reason why is if you look at the pill and the studies with the pill, there's a 33% compliance rate with the pill at, thir at three months. So at least at I mean, three- Only 33% of people are actually taking it like consistently? Consistently, which is scary. So that's why when I bring them back at three months, I say, so how are we doing? And they'll go, oh my God, Dr. Schman, I haven't been taking the pill. I'll go, okay, so let's look at something else. Or they might be totally happy. So, and we'll talk about side effects because initially, especially going on, like some of the birth control that have hormones in it, you're going to get irregular bleeding or spotting. And that's just to work through it and calm patients down so that they understand the side effects of birth control. And the other thing that I failed to mention, and I start thinking this stuff, is just because you're going on the ring or a pill does not mean it prevents you from getting sexually transmitted diseases. So even though you're on forms of birth control, the IUD, the Nexplanat, whatever it is, you should, if you're with someone, use condoms or other forms of barrier methods, unless it's your husband and you choose not to. Um, I know we've talked about birth control for like half of this, but... 24 minutes of it. No, <laughs> half of it was STDs. <clears throat> um, are there... Are some birth controls more effective than others? Like, are some of them... If you're taking like the pill consistently or you have the Nuva ring in consistently or the IUD, are some of them going to be better at protecting you against pregnancy? You know, if you look at the package insert, all of them tell you they're 99.99% effective or 99.8% effective. I mean, you're looking at in the high 90s for just about all the birth control. Um, 
I mean, have I seen one better than the other? No, not really. I mean, I think the the most of the time the failure rates we're going to see are with compliance. So if we get a patient that comes in that got pregnant on the pill and that they're saying, I took the pill every single day. So then I break it down and I go, okay, you're on a 10 microgram estrogen pill. What time did you take it? And they go, well, I took it at 10 o'clock at night, one night. The next day I took it at six in the morning. The next day I took it at three in the afternoon. When you're dealing with pills like that, that are low dose hormone, you're going to get the fluctuations versus the NuvaRing or an IUD, the hormones stay more leveled. So that's the other thing that I warn patients. I go, yes, with low dose pills, they, you feel amazing. You have less acne. Your bleeding is a lot less. You're barely spotting each month, but you freaking miss this pill by eight to 10 hours. You're going to potentially get pregnant. So talk about those two. I've run out of questions. Are uh, you serious? Think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Melissa gave me like a lot of notice on this. Um, <laughs> I know Melissa, t M Melissa tells Sophia like an hour ago. Oh, by the way, you're going to be on Dr. Shaban's yeah. podcast, it but you did great. I think I what we're going to do is bring you back more often. We're going to do this quarterly with you. I you'll give us the college so. perspective. I have no perspective. Women's health. I'm like the friend that everyone goes to when they have like weird discharge or something, or they want to know about birth control. Well, now you I work. Feel like I'm not a good perspective of my, or a good representation <laughs> of my generation. No, but now you work in an OBGYN's office. You're like a physician by proxy to your friends. Exactly. You know the disease. That's what I tease my wife about. I'll hear her on the phone talking to people, going, "Well, I think you should do this and that," and I'm like, "Hello." What are you doing? She goes, well, I, I hear you, what you say to people. So yeah, you're learning. Yeah, I'm pretty much a doctor at this point. They, why even go to med school? Exactly. Nobody else is. <laughs> Dr. Chavan's apprentice, pretty much. There you go. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our podcast. Thank you, Sophia, for coming and joining me today. And we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day. Take care. Take care.